Okay, so today we're going to do a quick optimization problem. Uh, we're going to be looking at starting with a unit circle on a coordinate grid. We go to a point a comma zero that's above the circle, or sorry, zero comma a, above the circle, and we draw in lines of tangency to the circle to create an, e, uh, an isosceles triangle that circumscribes this little circle here. So there we go. So we get this picture here. It looks kind of like the Deathly Hollows, maybe. Um, but the goal is to try and find the particular value of a that's going to minimize the length of these equal sides here. Um, now, because of symmetry, we don't have to focus on the whole drawing at once. We can actually just focus on half of the drawing. And so I'm going to go ahead and erase half my drawing here and redraw this so we can only focus on half. So just drawing in half of the coordinates. We get this, drawing a half circle. Uh, close enough. Put in a point A up here. And then draw in half of my isosceles triangle. Now, minimizing the length of the equal sides is going to boil down to just minimizing the length of this one side. So we can minimize the length of that. We're good to go. Now, um, it's kind of difficult to get the entire length all at once. Um, it's very, it's a lot of, a lot of trigonometry, and, and um, it can be kind of difficult. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of create, look at this point of tangency. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and draw my radius in here. We're going to need that radius in a moment. So I'm going to you know, focus on the part above my point of tangency and the part below my point of tangency in, in slightly separate cases. We're going to focus on the part above because that's a lot easier to get and it can allow us to get the part below. So um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label this angle as theta. You know, that's often a good thing to do when you're working on triangles with circles. Um, get this particular angle theta in because now you can use that angle theta like you use it always. It's the, the trigonometry angle theta. Um, but what's more is that this angle can kind of travel around this diagram a little bit. In the first place it can travel is up here into this corner. Turns out that that is also equal to the angle theta. Um, that's pretty easy to see just using some, um, some of the interior angles of a triangle needs to be 180 degrees. So that's the angle theta right there, which means that we have a nice right triangle here that we actually know two of the side lengths for and the angle, which is a lot of information. So if I come in and draw that right triangle in, Okay, so you can see we've got a base, a height, and a hypotenuse. And this hypotenuse is the distance along the y-axis, which is a. This base is a radius of the circle, which is 1, since we're working with a unit circle. This top angle is theta. We don't actually need it quite yet. It's good to have. And um, by Pythagorean theorem, we actually already know this first length that we're looking for, if I call that S1, S1 is the square root of a squared minus 1. So by Pythagorean theorem, we can get that first length pretty quickly. Okay, so now we need to get this second length, this so-called S2, as I'm going to label it. So we need that second side length, um, that second slant. Um, and the way we're going to get that is by noting that we can create a similar triangle to this first. This one this is actually going to be a similar triangle because this angle up here is theta. This angle down here is 90. So all the interior angles are the same. Um, and that means that ratios of sides are the same and, and all the um, Sokotoa stuff should all be the same as well, which is pretty cool. So um, what do we know about this? Well, we know a few things. Um, let me go ahead and draw this triangle in so we can start to put some labels in of things that we actually kind of know. Okay. So this length right here is S2. This angle up here is theta. And that's unfortunately all that we can label with so far. Uh, but we actually know quite a bit more than you may seem because we know the y coordinate for here. We actually know that in terms of theta. Y here is sine of theta. That's the y coordinate. And then this length down here is 1. So this height is going to be 1 plus y, or 1 plus sine of theta. Now what's sine of theta? We can use this triangle to find that out, because sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. We know that sine of theta is 1 over a, since this total height is 1 plus sine of theta, that total height is 1 plus 1 over a. 
that's the height of that little right triangle right there. Um, we don't really need, uh, I'm not going to use 1 plus 1 over a, actually, I'm gonna, we want to find a common denominator. Very easy to do. You're going to get a plus 1 over a. A little bit easier to work with if we're doing some of the algebra we're about to do. Okay, now we really want this side length here. We really want that. Um, so we need some sort of formula that will relate an adjacent side and a hypotenuse, like cosine, which is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Now we actually can get cosine of theta from up here. Cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So square root of a squared minus 1 all over a. It's going to be cosine of theta. And that is equal to adjacent uh, sorry, adjacent over hypotenuse, a plus 1 over a divided by s2. So this is going to equal a plus 1 over a times s2. Okay, so let's focus on this stuff here in the box. I'm going to bring it over here so we can calculate s2. Once we have s2, we're, we're pretty close to being done, actually. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we've got. We've got the square root of a squared minus 1 all over a equaling a plus 1 divided by a times s2. So that's what we have so far. I'm going to go ahead and erase some of this trig in the middle of the board that we don't quite need anymore. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, we can solve for s2 in terms of a, which is exactly what we want to do. So first thing to do would be, I guess, cancel off these a's in the denominator and then reciprocate both sides. So that 1 over the square root of a squared minus 1 is equal to s2 divided by a plus 1. So we get that expression there. And then you can multiply both sides by a plus 1, giving you s2 equals a plus 1 divided by the square root of a squared minus 1. And we can simplify this, right? a squared minus 1 is a plus 1 times a minus 1. Um, and so this will simplify to become the square root of a plus 1 over a minus 1. That's going to be our s2. Okay, so s1, this guy, s2, this guy, we're good to go. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and erase most of this. We don't really need anything anymore except for S1 and S2. Okay, so let's write down S, Oops, a bit more. S, which is equal to S1 plus S2. That's going to be equal to square root of A squared minus 1 plus the square root of A plus 1 over A minus 1. And this looks kind of gross currently, like at the moment, it, it's not really a nice equation, uh, but it will get better, trust me. We, we can definitely simplify this up before we take the derivative, um, and it'll make our lives a lot easier if we decide to do that. So we are going to. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is that this right here can be, we can factor this, so this looks like the square root of a plus 1, a minus 1, plus square root of a plus 1 over a minus 1. And it may not seem entirely obvious what we should do here, but um, there is a process that we can go through to try and simplify this. And, and the, I think the best thing, or the best option that we've got, is to try and factor out 1 over the square root of a minus 1. Um, it may seem like kind of like, why? But uh, trust me, it will actually work out for us if we do that. So what does this give us? It gives us 1 over the square root <coughs> of a minus 1 times, and then what do we leave behind? Well, here, uh, we've got the square root of a minus 1. It's not in the denominator, so when we factor it out, we're actually going to essentially put in another factor in the numerator, which is going to cancel the square root, giving us a minus 1 <coughs> times the square root of a plus 1 plus the square root of a plus 1. So that's all closed now. 
And uh, we can go ahead and simplify this as well. A minus 1 plus 1 is A. And um, this is going to end up simplifying to A times the square root of A plus 1 all over A minus 1. So that right there is S. Let's go ahead and write that up here at the very top. This is what we are actually trying to minimize. Woo! S is equal to A times the square root of A plus 1 over A minus 1. If we can find the value of A that minimizes this, we win. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> You've just won. So that's all we got to do. It's all we got to do. Um, but it is going to involve quite a little bit of, you know, product rule and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and erase all this, because now we have a pretty hefty derivative on our hands that we got to take. So we want to calculate ds dA. What's that going to equal? Well, we do have a product rule on our hands. We have uh, a times the square root of a plus 1 over a minus 1. So we're going to go ahead and take the derivative of the first times the second, giving us the square root of a plus 1 over a minus 1, plus the derivative of the second times the first. Now that's going to be, oof, so it's going to be quite the chain rule. So let, let's see what we get. Well, we're going to have the first, we at least get that, then we get a times the derivative of this big thing. And we got to do that with chain rule, so we start with the outside, which is a 1 half power, and then you take all this to the minus 1 half, which is basically just going to end up being this. Okay, that's the derivative of the outside, and we multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is mercifully easy to compute. Um, and so this is going to be times the derivative of a plus 1 over a minus 1, which we can do really quickly with quotient rule. So you take the derivative of the top times the bottom. That's going to be a minus 1 minus the derivative of the bottom times the top, which is going to be a plus 1. Don't forget your parentheses. It's really important to group those negatives. Um, and that's going to be all divided by our denominator squared. And that's on the inside, so this is going to be a minus 1 squared. Okay, so we end up with this huge expression here, which is pretty gross, um, but it will simplify. At the very least, this does, in fact, simplify. And the very first thing that we can do to make it simplify is we can factor out a plus 1 over a minus 1 to the negative 1 half power, right? We got, we got it to the positive 1 half power here. We have the negative 1 half power here. Let's go ahead and factor it out, because that'll simplify this, which is good to do. So this is going to equal a plus 1 over a minus 1 to the negative 1 half times. Okay. So what do we leave behind when we do that? Well, this just becomes a plus 1 over a minus 1. Easy peasy. a plus 1 all over a minus 1. And that's going to be plus a divided by 2 times 1, so I'm, I'm not even going to write that down, times whatever this thing turns into. So what is this thing? Well, we get a minus a, which goes to 0. And negative 1 minus 1 is going to be a negative 2 all over that denominator, a minus 1. So now we have this lovely expression here, um, and we do want to keep simplifying it. So um, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and reciprocate that so we can write it as a square root now. This is going to be the square root of a minus 1 over a plus 1. That may or may not have been a great idea. This is going to be times. So let's see what we've got here. Well, first off, these 2's cancel. It's just going to be a 1, so I don't need to worry about the 2 in the denominator there. But I do need to worry about the a minus 1 squared. We only have an a minus 1 right here, so we need to multiply top and bottom by a minus 1. That's going to give us a squared minus 1 on top, and that's going to be minus a. And that's all going to be over a minus 1 squared. Cool. This is really, really cleaning up. Um, we're almost done. Uh, just a little bit further to go. Um, we can go ahead and simplify the a minus 1 over a minus 1 squared. The, the square root on top and the square on the bottom is going to give us a 3 halves in the denominator. And we can rearrange the order of this to make it look more pleasing to the eye. And that's going to end up giving us the following. 
we're going to get a squared minus a minus 1 divided by, um, then you have a square root of a plus 1. Well, actually, let's do the a minus 1 stuff first. You get a minus 1 to the power of 3 halves, and then the square root of a plus 1. Woo! Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, looking at this, we want to try and find critical points now. And there are sort of, you know, there's two ways to get those critical points. You can either find spots where the derivative fails to exist. We can see that there are, in fact, two points where the derivative fails to exist. Down here at positive 1 and over here at negative 1. Those are going to, you know, cause the derivative to blow up. But if you look at the original A, positive 1 would also cause it to blow up. So that's, that doesn't really make much sense. And um, negative 1 would do some weird things with, like, well, would make things go to 0, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. That's just weird. So, um, and that doesn't make any sense. It has to be above the circle, which is already at height 1. So, um, none of those make any sense. Obviously, 1 and negative 1 are, you know, they're out. Um, so, the only hope for critical points is going to come from this polynomial in the numerator. Um, when that polynomial is equal to 0, we can find some critical points. And so, if I come over here and I set a squared minus a minus 1 equal to 0, you can use quadratic formula really, really fast to go ahead and get the two roots here. They're going to be a equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. Now, we weren't looking for two different solutions here. We were only really looking for one. Um, and you can do a couple different things to, to, to locate the minimum. One would be to just, you know... Uh, I guess you use a uh, first derivative test. That, that's, that's a surefire way to get this one done. But the other one is to just note that we are working in a problem with a certain amount of physicality here. We're talking about side lengths of triangles. And 1 plus root 5 over 2 and 1 minus root 5 over 2 are very, very different for a simple reason. That being that root 5 is bigger than 1. So 1 minus root 5 over 2 is actually a negative number, which makes no sense given the drawing that we were trying to work with. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and remove my negative solution, probably should do that with my eraser rag. Okay, and there we go. A is equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, which in fact, it turns out, uh, this is the golden ratio. So that, that super famous number that all the Renaissance painters seem to care about. Um, yeah, the answer is the golden ratio. So um, that's the solution to this particular optimization problem. If you choose to, uh, to start your triangle at a height of 1 plus root 5 over 2 above the x-axis, and you draw those tangent lines, you create an isosceles triangle. That triangle is the particular triangle that has minimal side lengths for those two equal sides. So that's it.